Good morning. Welcome everyone. Quickly, show your teeth off to someone, to the person to your left and the person to your right. Go. All right, hopefully you have looked over the bulletin you received. Let me highlight a few things. And while you grab the bulletin and open it up, um, if you are visiting with us, make sure that you grab one of these at the end of your pew to fill out. And after you have filled it out, you'll put it in the golden plate as it comes down your aisle in a few minutes so that we can, we can have a record of your visit. All right, um, after the service this morning, as you exit, do not forget to grab your church directory if you happened to turn it back in because the pictures were fuzzy and blurry and made you question your eyesight. You will get a new one, and it's fresh, it's clean, it's beautiful. So um, make sure that, especially those who returned theirs, that you get that first today. Um, but there are some extras as well. Um, children... Go home, eat a sandwich, take a short nap, and then get back here at 1 o'clock. And this extends to any age group, actually. Um, we're going to go to the pool. We're going to go swimming, have some fun at the pool at the Aquatic Center in Anniston. Um, so meet us at 1 o'clock. Anybody's welcome. All right, this Wednesday we have food distribution at 430. And just know that they're still in need of some canned items and cereal to help out. Um, college kids, look there inside the bulletin. You have an invitation to the Burns' house for Bible study and chimichangas. And the, um, the deacons this morning decided to call the night the chimichangas and the heartburns. So that's the name of the night. It's not, well, it's an afternoon, actually. But um, just make sure that you read about that. Get with Miss Becky so that y'all can gather that that afternoon for some fun. And um, Linton Study Group, we will meet tonight, 6 o'clock, in the Senior Suite. And then one last thing to announce. Um, I know it's still February, but spring is in the air. It, you know, we're during the time of Lent. We're preparing for Easter. Let's have an egg hunt, okay? So we're going to have our glow egg hunt March 27th. Um, but there uh, are some things that we need for this to happen. We need some candy and plastic eggs and glow sticks. And the reason I'm asking a little bit earlier, an angel named Linnell, she has a group of students at her high school that they're gonna help stuff the eggs. Oh, can you hear it? It sounds, it's, it's a great idea. But we need those items uh, a little bit early this, this year to get that done. So if you would like to go ahead and get that shopping over and donate the candy and such, that would be very helpful, all right? Now, you know, that doesn't mean you skip over the rest of the things written in the bulletin. Please read over that piece of paper. It's very important. Um, all right, now let's prepare ourselves as we begin worship. So would you please pray with me? Loving divine Lord, today may you help us make our lives an offering of quiet commitment to thread love through the torn garments of society. Help us to discern how to use our gifts and talents in ways that nurture your kingdom. Amen. let you know too this afternoon at 1 30 please join us um, and help us prepare for the Easter season we'd love to have you it's not too late we're going to be working on our Easter music so join us when we make that correction um, that we will have rehearsal this afternoon at 1 30 so we'd love to have some new faces join us so will you stand and sing with us this morning Jesus name above all names
seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a joy to be with you here today on this beautiful, start off a little chilly, but still a beautiful Sunday morning, going to be a beautiful day today. Um, this is the time in our worship service whenever we gather to lift up together, to, to intercede on behalf of those in our congregation who are sick, uh, also to care, just pray um, that God would strengthen us and encourage us not only throughout this time of worship, but beyond. So if you would, please bow your head with me. Let's go to our Lord now in prayer. Our most gracious and merciful Father, who has lavished your love upon us by sending us your Son, Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life for the flock. All we like sheep have gone astray, each has turned to his own way, And were it not for your tender care, we would be but food for the enemy who roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. So defend us, we pray, against the enemy's attacks. Comfort us, we ask, as we recover from our wounds and cleanse us from our sins. God, we pray that you would transform our hearts so that our loves are not the same, that the temptations that have allured us for so long would no longer be effective upon us because... Our hearts have been transformed by your love. God, would you help us to bear fruit in keeping with our repentance? And so having been saved by your grace, would you reveal to us the good works that you have prepared beforehand that we should walk in? Open our ears to hear your voice, open our eyes to see that we might see the lost and the broken, the suffering and the downtrodden, and that we might act in accordance with your love. God, today we pray for those who are sick. Would you be with them? Be with those who are lonely. God, be with those who struggle with any type of illness. Heal them, we ask. Restore them. But restore to them the light of life. God, we also want to lift up today our governing leaders. We pray for our president, governor. We pray for the city council and mayor in Jacksonville. We pray for the uh, county commissioners here in Calhoun County. God, we ask that you would give them wisdom. God, that in whatever role they may occupy, uh, God, that for any person who serves in the government, that, uh, Father, that as they receive from you, that they would work for justice and equity for all who live within their uh, districts, God. Um, God, whenever one has a position of power, it's easy to turn one's energies towards just one's own uh, comfort, towards one's um, to, to be becoming more powerful and more loved. But, Father, uh, for those in the government, they have a call to serve all people. Um, And so we pray that you would give them wisdom, help them to deny themselves, and to do the work of justice. Father, we also just pray for our church during this season of Lent that you would, again, help us as we read and study your word, uh, as we look inward, and, Father, look outward, that you would uh, just guide us by your Holy Spirit. You know that we have no power in ourselves to keep to help ourselves. So keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities that that happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt our soul through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. During the 40 days of Lent, the Christian church prepares to observe the Lord's passion and resurrection. We examine ourselves as we remember the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. In this season of repentance and fasting, we come to terms with our mortality and need for God's mercy. The candles around this cross represents Jesus' life and ministry. Each week, we extinguish another candle as we draw closer to that dark day of crucifixion. And there he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at at, at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were, were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. 
And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. We extinguish the second candle as we remember the radical inclusion of Jesus' life and ministry. Let us pray. Loving God, help us to learn what it means that those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Help us to see in your call to discipleship a radical inclusion of even those so many others may deem sinners, unfit, unclean, and unwelcome. In this season, as we draw closer to your cross, help us to see in your life, death, and resurrection the power of all-inclusive love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. my bag today. That usually means that there's going to be something that comes out of it. I promise it's not alive today. Maybe it is. I don't know. I hope not. So I have some things here that I'm going to show you guys, and I want you guys to tell me what they are, okay? So what are these? Towels. They're paper towels, and what do you use them for? Clean your hands, maybe you Maybe you use it to clean some counters, you know, like use them to clean up. Um, so what about this? That's some soap. So this is dish soap. You use this whenever you have some dirty dishes in the sink. Maybe you're trying to clean up your kitchen, right? Yeah, and then you wash it in the grease. I have some Windex. What is this for? Yeah, it's for a street free shine every time. Um, <laughs> Use this to spray your windows when you clean them up. So all of these things, what do we use them for? Cleaning. So do you guys ever help clean at home? No. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. How do you guys know when it's time to clean up? When it's messy. When it's messy. I like that. So let me tell you guys a quick story. Um, so this one time, Jesus, it was time for Passover. He was headed to Jerusalem. So he goes and he goes to the temple. And when he gets there, he finds a lot of stuff just messy. There's people and they're selling animals like cows and sheep and stuff. Um, there's people trying to charge other people money so that they can put money in the offering plate. It's a whole mess in there. And it's not really looking like a temple. It's looking more like a trade day. So he goes in. And do you guys think that that made him happy to see it so messy like that? No. He goes in, and what do you guys think he does? He cleans house. You know, he tells him. He says, what are you guys doing? Like, we got to fix this. So he goes in, and he fixes it. So our hearts are kind of like that sometimes. Um, did you guys know that we can clean up our hearts? No? Yeah? How do you guys think that we can do that? Praying. That's a big one. Maybe saying sorry to our friends when we do something mean. Being nice to other people and listening and following directions, that's how we can do things to clean our hearts. So now is a good time. Now we're in Lent, and that's a really good time to remember that and remember that when our heart gets messy, we got to clean it up because that's the thing that's going to make Jesus happy. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to go to study church at the end, okay? Precious Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning that we've had the opportunity to gather together for worship. Please help us remember that our hearts are part of your temple, too. And please help us remember to clean it up anytime it gets a little messy. We love you so much, God. Amen.
Bible says that God's solid foundation stands firm. The Lord knows those who are his. Will you continue to worship with us this morning and stand? How firm a foundation. If you'd like to grab your hymnals, it's 275. Dear Lord, as we come to this beautiful Sunday morning, we are grateful for the opportunity to come to your house and worship you. We thank you for our many blessings because we are such a blessed church in so many ways. As we enter the time in the service to give our offerings, I pray we give from all our abundance and with open hearts, and that we use these offerings in ways that glorify you. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your many blessings, but especially your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.
Um, if you have your Bibles with you today, I'd invite you to turn to Lamentations chapter 2, Lamentations chapter 2, in the Pew Bible. Again, I believe the page, I remember last week, Lamentations 1 was page 666, which means it's probably on page 667 or 668 in the Pew Bible. Again, you might have your scripture journal, the text will be on the screen behind me. Um, if you've been reading along to follow uh, with me, uh, follow with us together as we go through this series, uh, you've, if you've read about Lamentations 2 ahead of time, you, you realize it's a challenging text. Uh, I got a text last night from somebody, and they said it's a very devastating chapter, and that's, I don't think there's any other word to describe it that way. And before I read it, I just want us to rem- I want, to, want us to remind or I want to remind us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so as we read about the reality of God's judgment today, we also need to remember that God is merciful. And so as we finish today, I'm going to uh, accompany this reading with a reading from the Gospel of John as well. But uh, we will read Lamentations 2 in full, for this is God's word to us. So if you would, please stand for the reading of God's word. How the Lord in his anger, has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He brought down, the ground, he, he brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He is withdrawn from them, his right hand in the face of the enemy. He is burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He has bent like he has bent his bow like an enemy, with his right hand set like a foe, and he has killed all those who were delightful in our eyes, and the tents of the daughter of Zion. He's poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has laid in ruins its strongholds. And he has multiplied in the daughter of Judah, mourning and lamentation. He has laid waste his booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He's delivered into the hands of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They, cl- they raised a clamor in the house of the Lord as on the day of a festival. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out the measuring line. He did not restrain his hand from destroying. He caused the rampart and the wall to lament. They languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has ruined and broken her bars. Her kings and princes are among the nations. The law is no more. And her prophets find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They've thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out on the ground because of the daughter, the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. They cry to their mothers, Where is bread and wine? as they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city, as, they, as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. What can I say for you? What, to what can I compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They've not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes but I've seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. All who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? All your enemies rail against you. They hiss. They gnash their teeth. They cry, we have swallowed her. Ah, 
This is the day we long for. Now we have it. We see it. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He's made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Their heart cried to the Lord, O daughter, O wall of the daughter of Zion. Let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out in the night, at the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Look, O Lord, and see. With whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned as if to a festival day my terrors on every side, and on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I held and raised, my enemy destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Did you remain standing, please? Sorry. I want to read from John chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. When Jesus saw Mary, the sister of Lazarus, weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. You can be seated. Let's pray. Father, we need thee every hour, and we surely need you now. So would you be with us as we hear this word? Father, help us as we grapple with the reality of your wrath and your judgment. For without your spirit, we should never stand. Help me stand. I pray this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. In his memoir, um, All Over But the Shouting, many of you have read it, Rick Bragg, uh, many of the stories happen right around here. Some of you are in the stories. Uh, but in, 19, in the October of 1991, he tells a story that was far away from Pleasant Valley as he traveled to Haiti to cover a coup that was ongoing. The president who the people had elected had just been exiled. And Rick writes this in the book. He says, Crips rise from old graves, four to eight caskets high. A young man steps on the top of one and climbs the concrete cross, hoping he can find his father's crypt from there. But all he sees is his own future. The cemetery stretches for five acres until it blends into the stink and swelter of the slums where naked babies stand in sewage and old women hid from view because it is shameful to starve. He writes of cities of mass, uh, just mass huts where people are living, children whose stomachs are enlarged from starvation, women who, because of their starvation, are too shameful to be seen in public, Young and old alike beg for food as they wither. Three years later, he goes back. And there he writes how he witnessed people who had been brutalized. Uh, he sees men who, carrying machetes who had brutalized women with them, women who had survived sexual violence, police who had shot the poor with machine guns with regularity for no reason at all. He writes that he wouldn't have been, wanted to be there in a nightmare, but he still had to wake up there every morning. What he witnessed 30 years ago happens still in the world today. Right, we can recount the news headlines from two years ago whenever we saw not just war violence, but thuggery from Russia as they attacked the nation of Ukraine. Right, if you saw the news footage on October 7th and following in Israel of the atrocities that Hamas perpetrated against them, or if you keep following the news and you see the atrocities perpetrated that the Palestinians suffer as their children die in the streets from bombs. It's not new, and it's a reminder to us that the horrors of war 
of the horrors of war, even though we should be thankful that there is a Geneva Convention, but the thing is that people don't have to, people can violate that. And horrors still happen in the world. The very act of war is devastating. That type of violence isn't that dissimilar to what Lamentations 2 describes in our text today. Grasping for words, assembling together to record for those who follow what had happened and how they were feeling. Yet, there's a distinct charge in Lamentations 2 that distinguishes it from the journalistic accounts of what happened in Haiti or what happened in Russia or what's happening in Palestine or what happened in Israel. There's a distinct difference, and it's that they're not just recording mere facts. These things happened. The Babylonians invaded. They killed a lot of people. Here's what's different, is that it's not the perspective of a journalist, but rather the perspective of a prophet. The prophet in Lamentations 2 says again and again that in 587, whenever the Babylonians attacked the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, that beyond a shadow of a doubt, it was you, God, who did this to us. Just look at verses 1 and 2. It opens up, see how the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. Look at it. He cast down from heaven to earth. He has not remembered his footstool. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy. In wrath, he has broken down. He has brought down to ground in dishonor. The poet will not be misunderstood. He is asserting that it is God who assaulted Jerusalem. 28 times in verses 1 through 9, it is God who is the one who is leading the assault. In verses 4 and 5, he describes God as someone who has come upon us like an enemy. And the first human enemies that are mentioned in the entire second chapter don't come in until verses 15 and 16. God is the subject of these verbs describing the assault. And the attack and all of its accompanying devastation, not only upon buildings, but upon human beings, from the oldest to the youngest, are done at God's hand. And perhaps with the poet writing these words, and with those who had suffered through this tragedy, as we read Lamentations 2, we have to ask today this theological question. What does it mean whenever we speak about the wrath of God? What does it mean when we speak about the wrath of God? I think it's probably one of the most unexamined, critical questions in, uh, concerning the Bible that we have to look at today. I don't think people look it up enough. I think some people can kind of quickly arrive to maybe one conclusion. Look, the Bible speaks about God's wrath. He doesn't like sin. And therefore, he's just angry all the time. Certainly not angry at me. Right? I, I took care of that a long time ago. We kind of brush wrath off as if it's no big deal when people undergo God's punishment. Quickly dismissing ourselves as having any liability therein. Or here's the second thing people might do. They, they take, 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 that such depictions, they would assert, are incompatible with the God of the Bible, the God revealed in Jesus Christ. And that solution can lead to so many different errors. Right, one of the oldest, and this is my most hated heresy in the history of the Christian church, a history called Marcionism. And there was a, a, a man who came to the Church of Rome in the second century. He was a wealthy boat maker, and he really, really did not like the God of the Old Testament. He read the Bible, the same Bible that you and I are reading, and he said, that God is a despicable, violent God. And the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ isn't the same God as the God of the Old Testament. Now, there are people who take lesser variations. They don't put it that strongly, but often that's the implication. And here's the impulse. One, that I don't think that accords with what Jesus himself taught. Number two, uh, it, the result of that very line of thought, that the Hebrew Scriptures are barbaric and therefore to be discarded, uh, has led to untold amounts of anti-Semitism that have occurred throughout history. But here's the third thing that it does, is it takes the Word of God, which is included in the Bible, and rather than sit underneath it and hear that this is God's Word to us, regardless of where we come from, we have to hear from God, and it places us above the Word of God to sift out what we will or, or won't decide to read and to trust is God's truth. But Rick Bragg, whenever he writes about these events that he recorded in Haiti, he says whenever he got home, he talked to his mom, and she asked him, how was your cruise? Right? He, he, he knew that she, didn't, he, she would not be able to bear the devastation of what he was witnessing. So he didn't tell her the full truth. I'm not here to judge what he, that. I can understand it. But here's my fear, 
My fear is that whenever we come to the God of the Bible, whenever we come to the Christian faith, that we have an understanding that is kind of like, isn't it like a cruise? I mean, you went to church on Sunday. How was the cruise? How was the buffet? Did you get tan? When in fact, in the Bible, we have to take the whole thing. Right? We don't want to be ignorant of the parts that are challenging or that are difficult because this is how God has revealed himself to us. So I, th- I think that we cannot think or understand the wrath of God or judgment as categories. We can't, we can't understand them as categories that are attributed to God if, sorry, let me restart that. If we can't think of wrath and judgment as categories that are attributed to God, we can't understand the Bible as it pertains to God, sin, death, or salvation. What do I mean by that? Romans 1 puts it this way. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Right? Humans have rejected the truth that God has revealed and they have chosen to pursue other gods, other idols. Right? And, and God, for them, God is not someone to whom they're morally accountable, not, not someone to whom they will give an answer one day. He is not the judge of all the earth, but rather is just an accessory onto life. Right? Willful atheism is just the first step to living a lifestyle of one who just is, is ignoring God, which is only one form of rebelling against him. So what then is the wrath of God? Here's what I think the wrath of God is. It is the wrath of God is where the justice of God encounters human sinfulness. It's whenever the justice of God encounters human sinfulness. And as such, this is important for us to realize from the outset today Wrath is not a permanent attribute of God, right? We can talk about God who is beautiful, God who is truth, God who is holy, God who is righteous, God who knows all things, and those are true of God all the time. But the wrath of God is where his justice and righteousness encounters human sin, right? Therefore, any depiction of God as just a fickle, angry deity who is boiling over with wrath all the time, about to fly off the handle at anyone who commits any error, is not depicting the God of the Bible. But at the same time, people who depict the God of the Bible as a God who, you know, he's kind of indifferent. You do you. You know, live your life. He's not going to do anything about that. That's also a false depiction. So let me ask two questions to kind of probe further on this question of God's wrath. And we are going to get to the text in just a moment. Whenever we have to ask answer this question, why did Jesus become a human? Why did Jesus become a human? And the second question, why did Jesus die upon the cross? There's a short answer to those questions, and it's a good one, to save us from our sins. But why did we need saving from our sins? Because because sin creates a rupture that makes it impossible for us to have a relationship with God. Right, on our end, on the human end, sin just makes it impossible for us to have an appetite for God, for us to desire God. It makes us unfit to be in his holy presence. And second, because God is a holy God who is perfectly just, perfectly righteous. If he permits sin without judging, without righting the world, then he's not truly a just and righteous God. Right? Paul, the apostle, writes this, the wages, that is the reward, the paycheck, the thing that we are due, the wages of our sin is death. And there's nothing we can do about death. And here's the thing that we have to remember about God. God did not create us to die, but rather that we should live. He did not create us so that we would wallow in sin and guilt, but rather that we would be forgiven and to live in freedom. And so I think that as this pertains to Lamentations 2 in our text today, we have to realize the devastating effects of sin, why God has wrath against sin, and then also what God does to remedy that sin. So as we walk through the text, even if we have to walk through this with tears, here's what I hope you'll see today. God's judgment upon sin is complete and devastating. And thus, we must heed his warnings to repent before it is too late, by renewing a covenant relationship with him through the means he offers, namely faith in, his, in the Son of God who died in order that we might live. Let me say that one more time. God's judgment upon sin is complete 
and devastating, and thus we must heed his warnings to repent before it is too late by renewing a covenant relationship with him by the means that he has offered, namely, faith in the Son of God who died for us in order that we might live. Well, as we get into our text today, one thing I want you to know about Luke 2 is that it has a similar division as Luke, or sorry, I say Luke, Lamentations chapter 2. Is it similar to Lamentations 1? The first 10 verses are kind of one half of the poem that are recounting what God had done from a third person perspective. Verses 11 through 19 are a first person response to that. And then verses 20 to 22 are a prayer in response uh, to, that, to that exhortation. So we're going to look at the first half. And, and, and there we see God's judgment upon the unrepentant is thorough and unsparing. That's the first thing I want us to see. God's judgment upon the unrepentant is thorough and unsparing. In verses 1 through 10, the, the poet describes God's lack of mercy in verses 1 through 3. In verses 4 to 5, he describes God uh, like an enemy, that God has treated Israel like an enemy. And then in verses 6 through 10, he describes how God judged Jerusalem by laying waste upon its buildings. So the walls have fallen, the palace has fallen, most significantly the temple has fallen, and upon the individuals who suffered. Now, verse 1 tells us that the, on the day of God's anger, it had arrived. And now Jerusalem is engulfed in God's anger like a cloud, okay? Think about flying into a, if you're in a plane and you fly into a cloud, it covers everything. Moreover, he says that God has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. What is the splendor of Israel? Well, we could say that it's Jerusalem, which is the capital of, Jer of Israel. But even within the capital, within Jerusalem, it's a temp the temple, right? The temple itself has been destroyed, and not only, again, we can't just think of buildings, we have to think of people. On that day, God threw down and did not remember his footstool, it says. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1, uh, Isaiah, God says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. The footstool of God might not seem like a very dignified place, but it's often used to refer to the temple itself, specifically the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant sat. And here it says that God didn't remember the temple. Therefore, it was destroyed. The temple was the place where God dwelt with humanity. It's where heaven and earth met. And now that place has been destroyed. And we're told because God has not remembered. Whenever God does not remember something, it's not because he gets a case of amnesia, as if he forgot. But rather, it, what it is telling us is that there has been a shift in God's relationship with Israel. Right? And then, let me get to that. God's judgment is thorough and unsparing, but one thing that it's not is surprising. What do I mean by that? Well, what happened to Jerusalem was actually exactly in accordance with what God had told Israel. This happens in two ways. First, in the law that God gave to Moses. Whenever, in, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, whenever God is speaking through Moses to give the law to the people, in Leviticus 26, and then again in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28, God, through Moses, tells Israel the covenant blessings of the covenant if they obey and they keep it, and the covenant curses. If they break the covenant that God would made with them, here are the series of consequences that will happen. The way Leviticus 26 tells it is, if you remain in your hard-heartedness and your sin, first I'll send famine upon the land. And then, if you continue to walk contrary to me, if you persist in unrepentance, I'll send foreign beasts upon the land. And if you continue to walk contrary to me, then I'll send the sword. I'll send foreign nations against the land. and Break up the bread supply. And if you continue to walk contrary to me, I will devastate the land and lay your cities in waste and scatter you among the nations. Right? It's, it's this escalating serious judgment. God will send judgments to warn Israel to return to him. But if they continue to not, then more judgment will come. But there is good news if you repent, right? So if Israel had repented, if they had confessed their sin, humbled themselves, if they had made amends with God, then what God says is, I will remember my covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and Jacob. Remember, God did not remember his footstool. And what I think that tells us is that it's because Israel never repented. But here's the good news, and I want to keep referring to the good news throughout. Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, even once Israel gets taken out of the land, God will bring them back. We need to remember, even if Lamentations 2, can't, the author of it, can't see in the moment, that God also had a plan to restore Israel. 
But the first thing I want us to notice is that God had warned Israel this would come, but it wasn't just that this was something that God had, you know, announced thousands of years prior. I think, I think some of us fear, you know, that we're going to be going about our normal lives, and then at some point someone's going to dig up a law from 1811, uh, and, you know, suddenly we're going to owe the government thousands of dollars for something we didn't realize even existed, right? We, we had, you know, 12 dogs on our property. The law said you can only have 10, and therefore, boom, you know, whatever it is, okay? We fear that. But God didn't just let Israel, he didn't just cast this, you know, formally told judgment upon them. In Israel's lifetime, Jeremiah the prophet had been sent to warn Israel what was coming imminently. Okay? Uh, For 40 years prior to the fall of Jerusalem, Jeremiah ministered and spoke warning after warning to the people, warning after warning to the kings of Judah, warning after warning to the priests and the prophets to repent, to right themselves before God, and therefore to avoid the judgment. And he even got so specific as to say, God is going to send Babylon. He's sending Nebuchadnezzar, and this will be the day of the Lord, where God is going to use that to set things aright. In Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 8 to 10, God told Jeremiah this, And to this people you shall say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence, But he who goes out and surrenders to the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, who are besieging you, you shall live and shall have his life as a prize of war. For I've set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Right, even at the 11th hour, there's an exhortation for the people of Jerusalem to repent, to repent of their idolatry, to repent of injustice, to repent of their Sabbath breaking, to repent of their adultery. God had suffered long with Israel. Right? Think about this. God, one of his key attributes is that he is slow to anger. Right? This, what happened to Jerusalem wasn't a sudden, unexpected, violent overthrow. It was something that God had borne with him for decades and for centuries for their hard-heartedness. And so whenever verse 2 speaks about God's lack of mercy, the Lord has swallowed them up without mercy, it's not because God lacks mercy in his character. It's because the time for mercy has run out. And now they're going to suffer God's judgment, right? Verse 3 says it more fully. It says that God has withdrawn his right hand in verse 3, meaning that Israel no longer had his protection. He's cut them down, we're told, burned them like a flame, consuming all things. It's clear that the, in coming, the invading disaster would engulf every building, every body, man, woman, young, old, from respected elders to suckling infants. God allowed the temple to be destroyed. And this would rock the identity of the people to their core, right? If, if you read ancient accounts of the temple in Jerusalem, people uh, praised the, the Israelites for the temple that was built. And, and the people of Jerusalem had thought that this was inevitable. I mean, we have the temple here. God dwells in our midst. How could anything ever happen to us? Probably similar to Americans who thought that, you know, if you looked at the New York City skyline in the summer of 2001, I mean, look at all these buildings. Look at those twin towers right there. What could ever happen to them? But they were gone. they're not there anymore. In Jeremiah chapter 7, he has to confront this directly. The people are saying, oh, look, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. How can anything happen? And God says, listen, I, the tabernacle used to be at a city called Shiloh, and it's not there anymore. What makes you think that I won't? Verse 6 says that God destroyed his own booth, right? If if we have any place or any practice we think that will exempt us from having to deal with God himself, if anything becomes a substitute for true faith, God doesn't have to hold that forever. It's not just the building that God destroyed. In verse 9, it kind of brings the overview of what God has done to a head. There, There are no kings, no princes. That means there's no leadership for the people. Right? There's no law. This means that the priests cannot continue to lead and worship. The prophets have no vision. This means there's nothing that they can say to the people because God has withdrawn. And after the crushing bombardment of God's assault, nothing is left to do except to sit in silence. Remember, God's judgment is sweeping and his wrath is real, but the problem is Israel's hard-heartedness. Here's a, a, point, here's a question I want to ask now. Do we really believe 
that sin makes it impossible to have a relationship with God. And with Israel, do we believe, on the flip side, that living in persistent sin, we can do that and, and not have to face God's judgment at all? But God has given, he'd given Israel and he gives us a warning. Right? There is still a day appointed to come whenever God is going to come and he's gonna make everything right across the entire world. Right? Revelation 19 says there is still a day to come when the sun will come in judgment. But God has provided a way of salvation. Right? And this is what we have to remember. How does God do it? Where, where does God's wrath fit in this process? Where is God's judgment? It's because God, the way that he saves us is that he undergoes that judgment himself. Right? Remember what I said last week. One of the things that Lamentations helps us do is to understand the reproach of Jesus Christ upon the cross and what that means for our salvation. When Jesus Christ was crucified on Calvary, he suffered both at the hands of humans. Right? The, the Jews trumped up false charges against him. The Roman governor convicted him. The soldiers hoisted him up upon a cross. They beat him. They stabbed him. And those who walked by, they laughed and mocked him. All the things that Lamentations 2 says happened to them, by the way. Jesus suffered at the hands of humanity, but he also suffered and bore divine wrath from God on the cross for our sins. And this isn't to say that God committed violence against his son. It's, a, it's something that the son did. The son willingly went to the cross in order that he might save us to endure our punishment, to endure our shame. God's judgment is thorough and unsparing upon the unrepentant, but yet there is still time to repent. And this is an issue that Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, don't overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some consider slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should repent, any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and all the works that are done on it will be exposed. There is still time to repent. There is still time to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, as John the Baptist said. So, Lamentations 2, the first part, is that God's judgment upon unrepentance, uh, upon the unrepentant, is thorough and unsparing. And it, we get into the second part of Lamentations 2. The poet starts to sound a lot more like Jeremiah, and he recounts the personal horrors he witnessed. And here's what we see, that in calamity, God's people grieve with tears, leading to repentance. In calamity, God's people grieve with tears, leading to repentance. Look at verses 11 and 12. The speaker recounts how he suffers there. He says, my eyes are spent with weeping, my stomach churns. My bile is poured out on the ground because of the destruction of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. They cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine, as they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city, as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. How can one witness such things? How can one even read about these and not have your stomach churn and feel lightheaded? The death of children in war shows just how terrible the violence was. Verse 20 even goes further and says that in the midst of this judgment, women right, went to the great depths of eating their children. And that might seem like it's hyperbolic, but we actually have recorded events in history that this happened. Daniel Barakin, who was a Jesuit priest who lived in the 20th century, he writes this about this passage. In the iron age of war, an iron law is promulgated. It is the children who die first. War is mass cannibalism. We eat our own future. And in the horrid banquet, all, victor and vanquished, have a sordid part. More than any building, any wall, any fortress, any temple, to lose your children is to lose everything. And so the prophet asks in verse 13, with tears in his eyes, what can I say for you or what can I compare you, O daughter, of Jerusalem. Here's the answer. There's nothing. Nothing can parallel this pain. What can I liken you that I may comfort you? There is no comfort that can help you in the wound that you've suffered, a virgin daughter of Jerusalem. Your ruin is as vast as the thing. Think about how big the sea is. How many drops of water can you fit there? You can't number them all. That's how big your suffering is. Who can heal you? 
when there are no comforters, surely there's no human who can help this situation. Who can heal you? The only answer is that God can heal them. And we're going to get to that in just a little bit, but I want to note some other things that Israel has to grieve first. In verse 14, we learn that they have to grieve how they had been ministered by, to, to by their leaders. Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. In, in the book of Jeremiah, he regularly has to contend with prophets who want to lessen the word of judgment that God is issuing. Right? P- prophets who say, peace, peace, when there really is no peace. Right? God told Jeremiah there would be an exile lasting 70 years, and there's other prophets who come and say, you know, really in two years this thing's going to be all cleared up. Two years, people will be back in the land. Right? God had given them a word, but they dialed it back. There's always a temptation when you're proclaiming the word of God to not proclaim it fully, but to hold it back. All right, this is a temptation, right, that preachers always have, the one that I have, to tickle their ears, right, and, and, and not to say what God wants you to say. And one, the prophet has to be willing to speak what God has said. And second, the people have to be willing to receive it, right? But the people can't be judged for what they didn't hear in the first place. The suffering... So we have to grieve the fact if God's word is not fully proclaimed, if we only have a snippet portion of it all, and we don't really get to see what God is truly doing. The suffering is great. In verses 15 and 16, the people grieve the taunts of their enemies. The humans come and they, they, they laugh, they jeer at Israel for failing as they had. And again, they have to reckon again with verse 17 that this is not a surprise. But there is a final exhortation, and I want us to look at this for a moment in verse 19. And the stillness, as the people reckon with their vast suffering, they must now turn. I want to listen to the cry in verse 19. This is an exhortation to the people of Jerusalem. Arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the night, watches, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children, for goodness sake, who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Do you hear the urgency in this text of the cry for God? Don't wait. Your future, your children's future, it depends upon you turning to the Lord and coming to him right now. The stakes are too high. As we grieve with those who suffered in lamentations, as we grieve this past, we must understand that the stakes of our sin are too high. The wages of sin is death, by the way. If we should not, rep- if we should not repent, we will face the wrath and judgment of God. But as the Puritan preacher Thomas Watson said in his book, The Doctrine of Repentance, moist tears dry up sin and they quench the wrath of God. Moist tears dry up sin and they quench the wrath of God. So in calamity, God's people grieve with tears that lead to repentance. And and where is God to be found in all of this? How does one repent in the midst of a trial when one can't see clearly? Well, this is where I think our, our text comes to today. Even when we can't see, we must look to the God who sees. Even when we can't see, we must look to the God who sees. In verse 20, the sole petition is this. Look, O Lord, and see. There's no other request made. The rest are statements asserting what they have experienced. But look, O Lord, and see. Whenever we're suffering, whenever we are in grief, whether it's for our sin or not, right? Again, we're talking about specifically on lamentations, suffering that is the result of our sin, not, the, not Job. Okay, Job, who had not sinned and suffered, this is someone who clearly had, and he has a word from the God that this is exactly why it happened. We often have an inability to see ahead, right? We maybe can't see because the darkness is too great. We maybe can't see beyond the horizon of our present calamity. We maybe can't see because the fog of war and the the clouds of uncertainty are too thick. And sometimes we can't see because in our suffering, we're just staring at ourselves in the mirror and we can't see anything else. But there is a God who sees, and to him we cry. Right? Even if the only cry we can muster is a protest, God knows our pain, he hears our cries, he sees our situation. We need to understand that. I want to show you an image that maybe you all saw. Okay? I don't want to make light of this, but two weeks ago in the Super Bowl, uh, many of you saw this, and it probably elicited some strong emotions. Right? That's Travis Kelsey, the tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs, running up to his coach, bumping into him, screaming in his face in the middle of the game. 
Right? We think often that yelling should only go from one way, from the coach to the player, but here the player is yelling at the coach. And it just seems wrong, right? I heard so many people say the first thing he ought to do is go apologize to the coach afterward, which, by the way, he did. But whenever you see the photo, you have to think of the history. Right? Andy Reid started coaching the Chiefs in 2012. That's the same year that Kansas, Travis Kelsey was drafted and joined the team. They've been together on the same team for 11 years. They've won championships together. They've, been, they've spent over a decade in each other's lives. And in the heat of the moment, the younger man was frustrated and wanted to communicate his frustration to the coach. What I see here is that there is a security that he feels that he can go to the coach and say, hey, something's wrong right now. Whenever we pray to God, here's what we need to realize. That God has a chest, or he has shoulders that are big enough for us to cry on. And his chest is big enough for us to beat against. Prayer enables questions and complaints to rise to God from a relational foundation. And even if the terms of power are uneven, nonetheless, there fundamentally remains a communion between God and his people. Whenever we suffer, and whenever we see people experiencing great suffering, and whenever we read this text in Lamentations, we need to remember that we can pray to God because God isn't done. Often we can't see that God has got a way out of this, and we just can't see it yet. But I want to read another text from Jeremiah chapter 30. In Lamentations 2, they don't know the answer, but we have more context of what was going on. Lamentations 30, here's what God says. Thus says the Lord, your hurt is incurable, your wound is grievous. There is none to uphold your cause, no medicine for your wound, no healing for you. All your lovers have forgotten you. They care nothing for you, for I have dealt you the blow of an enemy, the punishment of a merciless foe, because your guilt is great, because your sins are fragrant, fragrant, flagrant. Why do you cry out over your hurt? Your pain is incurable. Because your guilt is great, because your sins are flagrant, I've done these things to you. Therefore, all who devour you shall be devoured. And all your foes, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall be plundered, and all who prey on you I will make a prey. Listen to this. For I will restore you to health. And your wounds I will heal. Heal, declares the Lord. God inflicts, but God also restores. God judges, but God also saves. Remember this, God's judgment upon sin, it is com complete and devastating, and thus, humans must heed his warnings to repent before it is too late by renewing a covenant relationship by the means he has offered, namely, his son Jesus Christ, who died in order that we might live. Here's one more fact about the judgment and chastisement of God, is that God's love never ends. We might endure the flaming heat of God's wrath for a moment, but his mercies endure forever. If you go back to Israel's history, not only would their exile end, God told Jeremiah to tell the people at the time that God would still raise up a righteous king who would come. And unlike the prophets who wouldn't speak God's word, he would speak God's word. Unlike the shepherds who feasted upon the flock, he would be the good shepherd who would lay down his life for the flock. Right? God's love for us is so great, and that yet while we were still sinners, still in rebellion, Christ died for us. And this is the word that we must embrace today. Every one of us, every one of our family members, every one of our children, our neighbors, our friends, and even our enemies must embrace this word that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. We have to admit that we are sinners deserving of God's wrath, but for the grace of God, we would have it. But here's the good news. There is grace. There is mercy. Jesus looks upon the death of his friend Lazarus, and he weeps tears, and the people can realize, look how much he loves that man. Grace beckons that we look to Calvary's cross and we hear the words of Jesus whenever he said, blessed are those who mourn. Even if we mourn for our own sin, even if we mourn for our own suffering, if we mourn for the sins of others and the suffering of others, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted because God is the one who will comfort us. He has not left us abandoned, brothers and sisters. He has sent us his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who will lead us in all truth. And we have to stand in that truth. 
We have to stand knowing that regardless of how hard the judgment is, God has provided a way for us to be saved. And that's why we gather today. Jesus died. Not only did he die on the third day, he rose from the grave. As bitter as the punishment was, the punishment that he endured, now he has given us the reward, namely eternal life. We don't have to live under the suffering of our own sin any longer, but we can turn to him and live. If you would, please bow your head with me. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we confess that there are times when our hearts are heavy. Whether we grieve the sin within our own life or the suffering we experience, or whether we're grieving the sin of those whom we love, whom sin has taken away from us. And we grieve when we see the pain and devastation of the world on display. And God, sometimes it's hard to see. But God, I pray that you would lift up our eyes to Jesus. God, help us to keep our eyes fixed to the future in hope. Help us to believe against hope that the promise of the resurrection is true. Let all the wounds and scars that humanity bears and all those wounds and the scars that we bear in our own lives, we know that you see them, you feel them. And God, that we live by your mercy. God, help us as we know your judgment is true and your wrath is fierce. Help us who have trusted in Jesus not to fear your wrath because your perfect love casts out all fear. We know love because you first loved us. And so, Father, I pray that as our hearts, even if we feel disturbed by Lamentations too, that we would keep, with the author of Lamentations, that we would keep pounding on the door of heaven, that we would keep our eyes fixed upon you. Help us to not be content in our sin, but rather that we would live and that we would, we would pursue the light of life. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Please stand and sing. May be seated. Again, I'd like to thank you all for coming today as we've gathered to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that as you go forward this week, the Lord would bless you and keep you, that he would make his face to shine upon you, and that he would give you peace. Go now in the peace of Christ.